Waterloo Station. And the last few revellers, or very conscientious workers, hurry to catch their last train. It's after midnight, and few will be aware that as they make their way home, above their heads, others are just starting work. These workers are renewing the roof over the platforms, or train shed as it's called. The project has taken around two years, and now it's nearing completion. It's been a challenging task for all those involved. This is one of the largest and busiest stations in Europe, and had to remain fully operational, which is why some of the work is carried out at night when the station is closed. It was a challenge that was met by some innovative engineering, which combined the best of modern materials and techniques with an existing sound steel structure, an enduring legacy from those who built it over 80 years ago. Waterloo has a long history. There's been a station on this site for over 150 years. But it was not until 1902 that work on the station, as we know it today, was begun. And that work was not completed until 1922. During the Second World War, the glass in the train shed roof was removed for reasons of safety and replaced in 1948. But by the end of the century, the roof finishes were close to their life expectancy, with steeply rising maintenance costs. They become leaky, rather dingy, and not what rail passengers had a right to expect. And there are around 300,000 of them passing through the station every day. The need to cause minimum disruption to those passengers was just one of the operational constraints on any plan to refurbish the roof. Uh, one of the key operational requirements was for us to, to be non-disruptive at platform level, particularly in the basis of the, the stairs going down to London Underground, back to where the concourse level sits. This became apparent as part of the stakeholder analysis we undertook with both Southwest trains and major stations. In addition, there are some 1,500 trains a day which had to operate without hindrance and everyone on the station had to be protected from the vagaries of the English weather and from any objects which might fall from the overhead workings. In addition, traffic flows outside the station had to be maintained. It was with those requirements in mind that the engineers looked at possible solutions for renewing the roof. In sheer size alone it represented quite a task, over five acres. That's about the size of seven football pitches arranged in nine barrels with almost 25,000 panes of glass. The whole roof structure is supported on 10 meter high riveted steel columns with the roof itself supported by 60 main valley truss girders linked by 380 high level trusses. After careful examination this 80 year old steel structure was found to be basically in sound condition requiring only refurbishment. Moreover, with some strengthening, it would also be capable of supporting an advanced slung scaffolding system, which would allow the platforms to remain free of any major supports. Married to a new flexible glazing system, it was a solution which really did combine the best of the old and the new. After months of pre-planning, AMEC began work on site at the beginning of 2001. In the ballast. Health and safety is always a prime consideration and everyone, including all subcontractors, were required to undergo an induction course before starting work on site. The type of scaffolding chosen was selected not only because of its relatively light weight but also because of the speed of erection and, most importantly, being a slung system, it presented no interference with passenger flows on the platforms. Erecting the 1,500 tonnes of scaffolding was mainly carried out during approximately 100 night possessions, effectively some three and a half hours when train movement has ceased and the station is normally closed. However, some of the work was also carried out during Sundays, when usage of the station is reduced. The scaffolding supports the lightweight protection deck. This deck not only provides a raised area to work on, but also effectively puts a weather-tight lid over the platforms. 
The decking itself was also lightweight, a composite construction with light metal facings, providing good sand absorption and rainwater collection. Areas which were to take heavier loads, such as walkways and storage sites, were clearly designated and given a reinforced surface. And ramps were installed to allow materials to be moved over trusses and girders, always at gradients to permit manual handling. Mobile rigs running on rails were installed in each of the 49 bays, allowing workers to operate safely and efficiently at heights. Because the decking reduced ventilation somewhat, an extraction system for the diesel trains was installed to ensure that public and station staff were not affected by any increase in the level of fumes. Also, noise was reduced by the introduction of acoustic barriers above the concourse, with sound levels being regularly monitored. And while all this was being installed, a new external gantry was taking shape on the east side over Cab Road, to allow the transfer of materials on and off site with minimum disruption to local traffic. Throughout all of this, passengers were kept informed of progress on the scheme by public notices. With the site isolated from the platform below, work had already begun on the main structure. The old riveted steel columns and the main girders were to be refurbished in situ. This included grit blasting and repainting. Much of the old paint contained lead, and here it was between 8 and 12 percent. That required the workforce to be well protected, and work areas to be encapsulated to protect the external environment. It also required the removal of the dust through a special extraction system, which allowed any hazardous materials to be dealt with safely. After grit blasting, the surface was prepared for the paint system. The new paint contains a low volatile solvent, which not only provides a 25-year corrosion protection, but also helps to reduce the health risk and the environmental impact. Its integrity was ensured by careful inspection and protection from damage during the project. Work on the nine roof barrels proceeded much like a production line. First, the old roof glazing was removed, nearly 1,000 tons of it. The workforce required protective clothing and equipment, as some of the old glazing frames contained asbestos rope, which had to be removed and dealt with separately. Once the glass was removed, the redundant steel could be dismantled and disposed of. The old access system of fixed walkways was now obsolete and would be replaced with mobile gantries and cradle systems, allowing easier maintenance of the complete roof. However, as part of the value engineering exercise, a major feature of this project, much of the old sound structure was to be retained. We're dealing with a structure here that is close to 100 years old. We were looking wherever possible to reuse existing components. A classic example of that is where we've reused close on 350 existing trusses and where we've had to introduce new components such as the, new, the patent glazing system we've chosen a system that is very forgiving in the tolerances and dimensions that we have to deal with. With each part being unique, some steel, some wrought iron and varying in size, few parts were interchangeable. This meant that the location of each part had to be carefully recorded and each complete truss packed in its own box and individually stamped prior to being sent away for galvanizing. The decision to grit blast and galvanize these trusses not only saved money, but more importantly, provided a life expectancy of 80 years, as opposed to a maximum of 25 years provided by paint. And so the work continued through the summer of 2001 and into the winter, with the workforce settling into a steady routine and with most of the travelling public hardly noticing the major work going on overhead. By the following summer, the project was well past the halfway mark, with both night and day work continuing without causing any disruption to the train services, and the workforce had achieved over a quarter of a million man-hours accident-free. Work was progressing well, with each of the specialist teams achieving high productivity. 
For example, the steel trusses were dismantled and re-erected by just 18 men. This refurbished steel, looking like some giant Meccano set, is being assembled and erected by a team of six, and they're impressed with the results. It's been very successful. Yeah. Once you do a few, and then you get the hang of things, rebuilding and that, the best way to get things in and out, then you get quicker as you go along. And then you replace all the rivets with bolts, different size bolts for different size rivets that come out. And uh, yeah, it works well. It'll be up today, yeah, we started this morning. So it'll be up today. And although they've already done it several hundred times, there's a certain satisfaction as the final bolts go into place. The glazing is being installed by a team of six. By the time the work's complete, they'll have put in over 25,000 panes of glass. The system uses laminated glass laid in aluminium glazing bars. It's a system with enough flexibility to be able to cope with any variations in dimensions of the old structure and to deal with the overall curvature of the roof. They too have the operation down to a fine art. Between the trusses, one bay will be done in a day, completed. All the angle fitted, all the bars, and in general, 42 pieces of glass. Not really a problem to do, if the weather's good. When it rains, it can be a problem. But rain or shine, there are targets to be met. As Roy Conway knows only too well. Speed of installation has been key on this particular project. The programme has demanded close on 500 square metres of roof covering to be replaced on a weekly basis. This has called upon using innovation. We're happy to say that we've maintained programme at a steady rate, particularly over the last 18 months. By early 2003, the temporary structures were being dismantled and taken away. With much of the new roof in place, the travelling public was beginning to see the benefits of the project new canopies on the platforms and new lighting, as well as the new roof itself. For all those concerned, delivering these essential improvements had been a major challenge. The old station roof was rather leaky and it's important in this day and age that we provide our customers with a dry and comfortable environment when they come into the station. And that was also a big challenge for the project while they were actually completing the roof in order to keep the station operational, to keep passengers happy while they were working over, overhead and to keep it safe for people to pass through. Now that we're approaching the end of the project, we can see a bright and dry station roof with facilities that people want to see in the station. We've had very good feedback from passengers so far and we're really pleased with the completed project. The last pieces of scaffolding and decking will soon be removed. And that's where we came in. For both Network Rail and AMIC, it's been a major project. And with the close cooperation of contractor and client, a highly successful one. Well, the client-contractor relationship on the project has been very good. The form of contract that we use is a collaborative arrangement, which means we work very closely in partnership with AMIC and the subcontractors. And so I would say, in that respect, the, the relationship on the project has been excellent. AMEC too is pleased with the results. Both AMEC and our clients see this project as being a real success. Um, this project will be used to benchmark similar projects in the future and we honestly feel that what has been provided here is good value for money. And perhaps we might also pay a compliment to those architects and engineers whose work over 80 years ago could be said to have laid the foundations for this project. Now, thanks to the foresight and ingenuity of today's engineers, their legacy will live on for another 80 years.